We live in a tech-driven world. What has led to the explosion of text messaging over the past few years? So many people are talking about this Messenger app. It used to be optional, but now it's going to be mandatory, I guess. The app has around 1.5 billion users. Text messaging is all the rage. More than a billion of them are sent every day in the U.S. We'll now be able to send photos or videos directly to just one person. There's over 3 billion Snapchats sent per day. And they've become such a huge part of our lives. It's a fast and instantaneous form of communication. But texting does have its limits, right? So these great apps and how they can really help you keep track of your text messages. Text messaging seems to cut directly to a person when they are in motion. It's another way of communicating with people, especially if you can reach people that you would just not normally reach. You guys might have heard of the newlywed couple who decided to celebrate their very first Easter by inviting their family over for, for a dinner. Uh, and the husband, being a good husband that he is, he, he hops into the, to the kitchen to help his wife with the preparations. And, and as he does so, he, he looks and he sees the ham, but he notices something about the ham. He, he sees that, that both of the ends are cut off of the ham, and they're sitting in the pan. And he thinks to himself, he's like, why would somebody cut off like perfectly good ends to the ham? And because he's newly wed and he's not wise enough yet, he decides to actually say this to his wife. And so he asks, he's like, why would you cut the ends off of the, off the ham? And she says, well, that's, that's how you cook a ham. And he thinks to himself, he's like, no, it's not. And because he's stupid and not wise yet, he says, he says, no, it's not. Like, that's not how you cook a ham. Now, defensively, she gets back and she says, well, that's how my mom taught me. So he decides he's going to lay that to rest for a little bit. And, uh, but but uh, dinner time comes around and everybody comes to hang out at the, at the family gathering. And they're sitting at the table. And he looks across the table at his mother-in-law and he says, um, you know, I, I noticed earlier that, that your daughter like, cut the ends off of the ham to cook the ham. It's like, uh, she said that you taught her how to do that. Is, is that true? She's like, yeah, that's, that's how you cook a ham. And he says, can, can I ask you, like, why do you cut the ends off the ham? And she goes, I, I, I don't know. That's just how my mom taught me. Well, it just so happens that Grandma's sitting at the end of the table. And, and so they all look down at Grandma, and the, and, and, and the, the husband asks Grandma, she says, Grandma, why do you cut the ends off of the ham? Why did you teach your daughters to do this? And she goes, I never taught my daughters to cut the ends off the ham to cook a ham. And they're like, yes, you did. You did that every year. And she says, I didn't teach you to do that. I did that because my pan was too small. <laughs> that's very good. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you all laughing um, because that's the only joke that you're all getting the whole time. All right. I promise I'll keep those to a minimum. My name is Corey, and I'm one of the pastors here, as you all heard from Aaron. He's actually up north. We're celebrating at the Northgate uh, location. They're doing some awesome things up there. Uh, but today, and in this series, we're going to be talking about the Bible, all right? And, and, I, and I promise you, all right, yeah, rest assured, we're not going to be cutting anything off of or out of the Bible in this conversation. As a matter of fact, last week we began this, this conversation. This is week two of this conversation. And, and let me remind you a couple of the things that we believe here at Trace. Uh, first of all, we believe that the entire Bible, Bible is the inspired word of God. Uh, secondly, uh, we believe that the Bible is true. And, and third, we believe that you should study it for yourself. It is made available to you. It is an incredible resource, all right? Uh, but with that being said, I think we oftentimes approach the Bible like the wife did the ham. We oftentimes simply accept what has been given to us without asking the right questions to help us to approach it and understand what has been handed down to us. Now, with that being said, I want you to think real quick to the very first Bible that you ever received. Now, the first Bible that you received was, was probably chaptered and, and versed and footnote and bound in some kind of leather. You might even had your, your name written on it in like gold letters. You all remember those, right? I don't know why it was gold. Maybe because it's the heavenly. I don't know. It, it, but it was given to you, right? Maybe it was given to you by a parent uh, or, or maybe by a pastor. Maybe it was given to you by a friend. Maybe, maybe by a stranger, I don't know how you got your first Bible, but you probably received it the same way that I did, and it had some assumptions behind it when it was given to you. Maybe they didn't say this out loud, but it was implied in some way, form, or fashion. <clears throat> this is God's Word. It's all true. Read it and do everything it says, right? That, that's, that's kind of the mentality that we were given when we were handed our first Bible. And so if you were anything like me, you took that seriously, and you took this preciously, and you said, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And so you started in the beginning, just like you're supposed to with a book, right? And, and, you, and you started with Genesis, and you got through Genesis, and you made your way through Exodus, and the stories were kind of weird and a little confusing, but they were pretty awesome. And so you, like, you kept reading through until you got to 
Leviticus, right? And at that point, at that point, not only did you start to lose the storyline, you probably started to lose consciousness, right? You started to lose some interest, and you started to lose hope that you would ever be able to finish this important book that you were given. Now, more importantly than that, you started to realize that if, if you did everything that this book said, you'd need to start slaughtering animals and stoning your friends and starving yourself for most of the delicious food that you enjoy, right? That was, that's the reality. Because in reality, if you did everything that this book says, you would not only be exhausted, you'd also be in prison. All right. I don't know last time you all looked, but like animal sacrifice and stoning people is kind of frowned upon in most of the 50 states. You can't do that, right? Now, all of us understand at a basic level, and if statistics are true, uh, most of us have multiple ones of these that are accessible or available to us in our homes. But the majority of us have not actually read this thing in entirety. But, but even at a very basic level, we all understand that there's a distinction between the books that make up this text, this, this book that we have called the Bible. But most of us don't have a blue clue why we obey certain things and we don't obey other things. You see, we don't understand why we cut off the ends of the ham in the first place. Now, <clears throat> here's the deal. Um, last week, I want to remind you of this. If we don't have a proper understanding of the Bible, you will use it wrong. We talked about this last week. If you don't have a proper understanding of this book we call the Bible, you'll use it wrong. You'll apply it wrong to your life, and you'll actually use it wrongly with other people. Some of you all have experienced this in your own life. You understand that that can be the case. But one of the things that has really helped me over the years as I've been approaching this, as I try to understand this rightly, to have a better approach, is to understand how we came to have the Bible in the first place. You see, a personal confession to you guys in regards to this is I've always at some level had, a, had an issue with how the Bible was compiled. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not one of those guys that really has an issue with the content in the Bible. I, I, I'm not one of those guys who struggles with the fact that a, that a fish swallowed a man and spit him up on sea. Like, I personally, say, like, I think that if, if a God can like, speak things into existence, then he, he doesn't have any problem like, accomplishing you know, the whole fish swallowing a guy thing. Like, that's not an issue for him. But my issue has not been with the content as much as the compilation. It's like, where do we get these texts in the first place? Who wrote them? And how do we know they're inspired? Who got to choose what was in it and what was out of it? And, and coming to a, a better understanding of this and researching this through the years and even having some conversations more recently, it's helped me to be a lot more confident, not only as I approach this, but also how I apply this. You see, this book, the, the Bible, is much more than just a book. Okay? It is one Bible that is divided up into two distinct sections Testaments, we call them, okay? Really, it's, it's covenants, and we'll be talking about that more next week. But, but it's also made up of 40 different authors who wrote 66 different works, different books, that, over a course of about 1,500 years. And that is what the Bible is. Now, how you got your Bible is different how the world got the Bible. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because I believe that if you better understand the story of how we got the Bible, it's going to help you to approach and apply the stories in the Bible better to your life and with others. Now today we're going to be continue on, uh, continuing on in this series called Text. And the message of this series, the topic of this series is going to be uh, the Bible for grown-ups. That's the title for us today. Now all throughout this series we're going to be taking a look at, at the letter that's written to the Galatians. And this letter was written by Paul. And today we're actually going to be taking a look at chapter 4. So today, as well as in your neighboring groups this week, and by the way, if you're not in a neighboring group yet, there's still time to do that. Just stop by the green wall out there and get into a neighboring group. We'd love to be able to help you uh, navigate that. But we're going to be taking a look at chapter 4. And for those of you all that missed last week, let me just give you some context to catch you up here. There's a guy named Paul who's a follower of Jesus, and he's writing back to the churches that he planted in the Roman province of Galatia, which is modern-day Turkey. Now, these Galatians are actually Gentiles, they're non-Jewish people, but they're being persuaded, they're being influenced by Jewish Christians to not only receive Jesus, but also to receive the law that was given to Moses. So it's Jesus and the law that these, these Gentiles are now being con convinced by these Jewish Christians to be able to follow. And that's where we're going to pick up in Galatians 4, uh, verse 21. Paul says this, he says, tell me, you who want to live under the law, in other words, you Gentiles who are trying to be convinced to go back to the law, do you not know what the law actually says? 
In other words, these Gentiles who had no clue what Jewish history actually was and what the law pertained to, he says, do you all even know what the law communicates? Because if you don't, let me give you a quick history of this. And then he proceeds to do that very thing. And what he does is he gives this flyby and this understanding of what the law is and what the Old Testament, as we understand it, communicates. And so hang on tight, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you all a quick flyby of the uh, Jewish scriptures as well. Now, when Paul refers to the scriptures, um, not only in his letter to the Galatians, but also in other letters that he writes, what he's not doing is not referring to what we understand is the Bible. That's not what he's talking about. He's actually referring to the, the Hebrew Bible or the Jewish scriptures. Uh, he would have known these very well because he was a Pharisee who studied these things. Now, these were more commonly referred to in, in the Bible as we have it as the law and the prophets, but we understand them nowadays as being the Hebrew Bible or the Jewish scriptures. And these scriptures included the story of creation, uh, the ancestry of the Jewish people, the interaction of God with the surrounding world, and a whole lot of rules and regulations pertaining to the promises uh, that were made with the nation of Israel. That's what's in this book. You see, this book is actually comprised of, of 39 different works over the course of about a thousand years, and it tells the history of the Jewish people. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a quick flyby. We could go into this more, but it tells of Abraham and the promise that God made to him to make him not only a father of the nations, but, but that through him that all nations would be blessed. And, and it tells of, of Moses, and it tells of, of, of him going up to the mountain and receiving the Ten Commandments, and what we now know is the Sinai Covenant that he made with the people at this time. And so now this becomes the law in which the old people, uh, the old people of the Old Testament understand and process through. And it tells about kings, and it tells about temples, and it tells about prophets. And all of this is Jewish history written by different people at various times, between about 1400 and 400 B.C., give or take a couple hundred years on the backside of that. And it's all been recorded and compiled and preserved in what we now call the Tanakh. Now, I, I share this with you guys because this is something that I didn't know beforehand, and so I wanted to share with you because I love giving insights to you guys that I'm learning. But, but the, the, the Tanakh is actually an acronym, and it stands for this. It stands for the Torah, which is the law. It stands for the Nevim, which is the, uh, the prophets, and it stands for the Ketuvim, which is the other writings. And that is what this book actually is, okay? The Tanakh is what we would consider today the Old Testament. It was written by Jewish people, for Jewish people, in the language of Jewish people, it is written in Hebrew. Now, we call it as the, we call it the Old Testament, but you have to understand to the Jewish people, there's nothing old about this. This was and is their Jewish scriptures. And it comes to like a, a halting end without a conclusion. At this point in time, when, when this book ends, there still is no the Bible. All we have at this point in time is a bunch of dispersed Jewish people with an unfulfilled messianic prophecy. That's what we have at the end of this book. But when the right time came, let me take you back to Galatians chapter 4. Paul goes into this with the Galatians. He's explaining to them about the law and about the old covenant and about the Jewish scriptures. And then he transitions and he says, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, just like the rest of us. But God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. You see, Paul, a Jew of, of Jews, as he would consider himself, he was a Pharisee who was very, very familiar with, with the Tanakh. He understood this. He would have devoted himself in his life to being able to read and understand this. He would have had most of this memorized and, and he says this, and more importantly, his life reflects it, that something happened that changed it all. This became old. It became something that was in the past because something new had come. And we understand that, that what was new was Jesus. Jesus came on the scene. And his life, and more importantly, his death and his resurrection were so impressive that multiple people, both Jew and Greek or Gentile, decided to record the life and teachings of Jesus. Now, let me be clear, guys. There would be no Bible if there was no Jesus. Now, I know that sounds like, you know, duh, all right? But sometimes we don't understand this. There would be no Bible as we know it if there was no Jesus. More specifically, there would be no Bible if there was no resurrection. 
If Jesus didn't come back from the grave, there would have been no reason to write about his life and what he did. Those things would have quickly faded away, but they didn't. And we have the Bible today. Now, let me be clear. Um, at the time that Paul is writing to the Galatians, they still don't have the Bible. Matter of fact, the Galatian people during the lifetime of Paul would have never had the Bible as we have the Bible. And so let me ask you this. How did we get the rest of the Bible? I feel a little like Paul Harvey up here. I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. All right? And so let's talk about how we got the rest of the New Testament. How many of y'all know Paul Harvey? Anybody? Yeah. All right, good. I'm not the only one. All right. <clears throat> I felt a little old for a minute. So anyway, our students still don't understand who Paul Harvey was. That's okay. So here's the deal. Um, I, I've, I've talked to a few of you guys, and, and right now is when I'm, I'm going to have you guys come up. But here's the deal. Because of what Jesus did, it was so remarkable that, that Luke tells us that many people set out to write accounts of the events of the life of Jesus. You see, in the ancient world, it was rare to have multiple accounts of, of, of the life of anybody. But in, in our particular case, when we talk about Jesus, we have four separate and reliable accounts from guys like John, one of the closest friends of Jesus. Matter of fact, if, if you happen to have John, go ahead and bring him up, all right? Uh, go ahead and start to make your way on up here, those of you all that I've given you some texts. Okay, we have, uh, we have accounts from John, one of the closest friends of Jesus. We have Matthew, the tax collector, who wrote about the life of Jesus. Uh, we, we have Mark, a Greek, who was the first to actually record the life and the teachings of Jesus. We have Luke, the doctor, who was incredibly meticulous about his detailed account of the life of Jesus. And, and all of these we understand and we call the gospel accounts. And they came by different guys at different times. And they, they, they made these statements about the life of Jesus. They recorded these. And, and people from the very earliest times saw these as being reliable. And they understood that this was the story of Jesus. We understand them as the gospels, but they had no clue that that would have been the case. Now, for the rest of you guys that have some of those scripts, go ahead and start bringing them up. In the meantime, early church leaders and planters began to write letters to help direct, guide, and remind people of Jesus. People like Peter, the fisherman. People like Paul, who wrote not only to the Galatians, but he also wrote what we know to be most of the New Testament to these other churches to let them understand who Jesus was and what he told us to do and how we should actually behave and live our lives. People like James, the brother of Jesus, wrote text about his brother Jesus. Guys, I got to tell you, I have two bro brothers, an older one and a younger one. You know what I'd have to do in order to convince them that I was the son of God? I, it, it wouldn't happen, right? What, what does somebody have to do to convince their own brother that they are the chosen one, the Messiah, the Son of God? Guys, that in and of itself is just an incredible feat. But here we go. We have all these individual texts that were written at various times by multiple people in multiple ways, all detailing the story and the life of Jesus and how we as a church should interact and be directed and guided in what we do. Now, here's the deal. These guys that wrote this stuff, they had no clue that what they were writing would eventually be compiled in a book that would ultimately shape the modern world. They had no clue. They weren't writing submissions to be included in the good book. Like, that's not what they were doing at the time. They might not have even realized that when they were writing these documents that they were inspired, that they were sacred. See, these guys didn't have a clue. But understand that the people who received these writings, the people who had fragments of these texts from the earliest times, and we can see this in recorded history, they actually saw these as being reliable and sacred and inspired scripture. And we see this because they treasured these writings and went to great pains to preserve them. Matter of fact, during the time of Diocletian, uh, who's a Roman ruler, during a time of great persecution of the Christians, they started to gather all of these Christian writings. Again, know the Bible, just Christian writings, Christian scriptures. They're fragments of, of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and all these writings of Paul. And they started to gather these things together and they started to burn them. What we see the early Christians doing is not only risking their lives, but sometimes sacrificing their lives to be able to save portions of these documents that would ultimately come together to make what we understand in the New Testament. But at that time, there was no compilation. They were simply sacred text 
in and of themselves. You see, it wasn't until the 4th century when Constantine came into power. He became the ruler in the empire, uh, the emperor. And what happened was he lifted the ban on Christianity at this time, which allowed scholars to come together and work openly to take these things and actually make them into this. This is the Greek New Testament. You see, as soon, uh, what would happen is, is the empire, this is crazy to me, the empire is actually responsible for crucifying Jesus, ultimately became the ones that funded the copying and the collecting of these sacred documents. I love how God works sometimes. The empire that was ultimately responsible for crucifying Jesus is the one that helped fund the copying and the, and the compilation of these documents. It's crazy. And then in AD 367, this guy named Athanasius. Everybody say Athanasius. All right, say it now five times real fast. I'm just joking. Don't do that, okay? Uh, that's an awesome name. Like, somebody should name their kid that, okay? This guy named Athanasius is the first one to formally list these 27 documents, these 27 texts that currently make up what we understand to be the New Testament canon, okay? Now, shortly thereafter, uh, guys like Jerome and Augustine circulated the same list. But however, these lists were not necessary for the early Christians, the majority of the Christians, because by and large, the whole church had recognized and used the same list from, the, from, the, from as early as the first century to understand this. See, these books were already reliable. They were already sacred. They were already considered scripture before they ever got entered into this. Now, let me help you understand, guys. Up until this point in history, up until about the 4th century, we didn't have what we know to be the Bible. But all of a sudden, now that we have an opportunity and the freedom that's provided by Constantine, we have the New Testament that's all compiled together, the 27 books that make that up, and it's put next to the Old Testament, and then we've put a bounding on it, and we've called it the Bible for the very first time in history. But guys, catch this. The binding doesn't make the Bible. You see, the words of the gospel writers and Paul are not inspired because they are entered into the Bible. You see, they were added to the Bible because they were already considered to be inspired and sacred in Scripture. Are you guys following me? You see, these texts that were written by these early authors were already considered Scripture before they were ever put together in a leather bounding like the one that we have together today. And now we have the Bible. But an understanding, and a proper understanding of how it came together helps us to understand how we should actually approach it. And I love this statement by Andy Stanley because it's, it's caused me to really be challenged in the way in which I present the Bible to other people and have conversations with other people. And this is what he says. He says, the Bible didn't create Christianity. Again, a statement that like shouldn't rock us, but somehow in our culture and understanding of the Bible, maybe your familiarity with it, like this causes you some consternation. But the Bible didn't create Christianity. Christianity is the result of an event, the resurrection, that created a movement, the church, that produced sacred and reliable texts that were collected and bound into a book, the Bible. Now guys, I could have spent some time with you, and I'm incredibly intrigued by this stuff, and I'd be happy to do this uh, on a separate time with you all, but I could have spent some time giving you some additional facts about the historical and the literary reliability of these texts, and they're, in, like, they're awesome and fascinating and, and convincing. Okay, I, I could have also spent some time navigating some of the anthropological and the archaeological evidences that point to the fact that we can trust the text of the Bible, and, and it can be trusted, okay? but, but proving that the Bible is trustworthy is not our goal today. That's not our goal today. What I want you to do is understand how it was compiled, because how it was compiled changes how you approach it. And here's why this all matters. See, when you bind it all together without understanding how it came together in the first place, it's possible for you to lose the historical purpose of putting this together in the first place. In other words, it's possible for you to use, lose the intended use of this book in the first place. And I'm going to make a statement that might be challenging for some of you guys. It's, it's cha it was challenging for me the first time I heard it, but, but I'm convinced of it. And here, and here it is, and I'm going to give some, some more um, uh, uh, kind of meat to help you all understand this. Uh, but the, the Bible was not meant initially to convince people of Jesus as much as it was meant to confirm the person of Jesus. 
It was not meant to convince people of Jesus, but it was meant to confirm what he did and how we should live. Now, I know that might be a problem for some of you guys, but, but here, here, let's go back to the Galatian church. Let's go back to, to what Paul was talking about because I think he makes this point really clearly. You see, what he says is this. A Gentile audience would not have seen this book, the Hebrew Bible, as being authoritative in their life. They didn't know it. They couldn't quote it. They didn't understand everything that was in this. It would not have been used to convince the Gentiles of who Jesus was in the first place. That's not what this book would have been used for. As a matter of fact, it, it was because Gentiles became enamored with a particular Jew, which is Jesus, that they became enamored with the sacred text of the Jews. Uh, and, and it was because of that, Gentiles were not interested in the Jewish religion, but they were interested in the Jewish text because of Jesus, because they saw Jesus in this text. You see, the Gentiles' pursuit of Jewish text were not historical or cultural as much as they were Christological. You see, they weren't going to the Jewish text for advice on, on how to live. And Paul makes this abundantly clear in this letter to the Galatians. He's telling them, don't go back to the way of living under the law of this book that we now call the Old Testament. Okay? Don't go doing that. You see, um, instead, they gained an appreciation of this text because they saw Jesus in it. This is why the Jewish scriptures made their way into the Bible as we know it. It's because they tell a story that points to Jesus. But they weren't used to convince people of Jesus. It was used to confirm the story of Jesus. Now, for that matter, for that matter, the documents circulating in the early church, these individual documents that we have that now compile the New Testament, these were also not necessarily used to convince people of Jesus. The large majority of the people that were having conversations about Jesus didn't have these texts in their hands at the time of having those conversations. They, they didn't have availability to these texts. Th these were fragments that were passed from church to church, and it certainly wasn't compiled in this particular fashion. They weren't used to convince people as much as to confirm that Jesus really is who he says he was, and we can show you, we can prove it, and it gives you some instruction and direction on how to live your life now that you know who Jesus is. But somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, we've come to the conclusion that we need to convince people that the entire Bible is true, before they can accept the message of Jesus. Somewhere along the way, we actually made this a stipulation to getting people to Jesus in the first place. And in this, and in this way, the Bible, as incredible as it is, has become a stumbling block for people. Partly because we don't know how it came together and we don't know how to actually use it with its intended purpose. It's become a stumbling block for people getting to Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong, I believe that there is power in the Word of God. I absolutely believe that. But catch this, guys. The power doesn't come from the binding. It doesn't even come from the words. The power comes from the truths that are communicated in this book. It comes from the resurrection and the event of Jesus Christ rising from the dead. And it comes from the power of His Spirit that is now available in us. That's where the power comes from. And here's why all this matters. It's because while there is power in the Word of God, less and less people these days see this book as authoritative. Less and less people that you will talk to will actually take what this book says and says, okay, because it says it, I believe it. Now, that might have worked for you. The Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it, right? That might have worked for you, and it might have even worked for a different generation. But these days, I'm just telling you, I talk to people all the time about this, and they have a major issue with the Bible. They don't see this as being authoritative. And just because I say the Bible says, or just because I say the Scripture teaches, that does not convince them of anything. It's a practical issue of understanding what this book was used for in the first place. And so let me ask you guys this, and maybe you are one of those people who would sit in here and say, you know what, I'm one of those people. Like, I just, I've got an issue with it. The, the Bible just doesn't cut it for me. What happens when you start a conversation about Jesus, and you start talking about the Bible says, and that doesn't cut it for somebody anymore? Where does the conversation go from there? How are you able to still get somebody to Jesus if they don't buy this? Guys, i, I got to tell you, my job as a pastor... My, my job as a pastor is not actually to teach the Bible. Okay? Don't get up and walk out now, all right? Stick around for just for a little bit longer. I'm almost done, all right? My job is not actually to teach the Bible. It's to point people to Jesus by communicating the truths that I find in the Bible, right? You see, 
when it all comes down, whenever I meet my Savior in heaven, I don't think God is, is going to ask me, hey, how, how well did you do teaching the Bible? I think he's going to ask me, how well did you do pointing people to Jesus? And if that is what I'm responsible for, I need to make sure that I don't create a hindrance for people when this could actually be used in a much more beneficial way. Now see, <clears throat> here's the deal, guys. Uh, the large majority of modern history has not had this book available to them. I, I think about this for a moment, just on a very practical level. Uh, this book was not compiled until about the 4th century. Even when it was compiled, it was, it was not made available through the printing press until about the 1400s. Even when it was uh, made available through the, the 1400s with the printing press, it wasn't available in most languages that people could, could read. And, and even... Even whenever it was compiled and it was put together in languages and it was, it was made available through the printing press, the majority of, of mankind was, was illiterate and, and couldn't even read this for themselves. So you talk about the large majority of modern history as we know it did not have this book available to them to convince them of who Jesus was. Yet the message of Jesus spread to people of all nations. And the Bible has been used to confirm that message throughout the years. And so if that's the case, if that's the case, is it possible that we can communicate the truths of the Bible without actually saying the Bible says, understanding that that might not carry the same kind of authority with other people that it might have before? I would say yes, absolutely. I communicate the truths of the Bible all the time without quoting chapter and verse. Matter of fact, I can communicate the truth of the Bible without getting somebody to have to believe the entire thing is true. I can do that. And if that's the case, is it possible that the historical accounts of, of John and, and Luke and, and Paul actually could carry more weight in somebody's life, could carry more authority than being able to actually have to hold up the Bible in its entirety? Because it's not just what the Bible says, it's, it's what else the Bible says that causes people to have a problem with it. And if they don't understand how it was compiled and how they should actually approach it, they might not see this as being authoritative. But if I can sit down with somebody and I can say, hey, uh, did you know that, that Matthew, Matthew, hey, he actually spent time with Jesus. He actually got to see his life and he recorded his life. Can I tell you what Matthew had to say about Jesus? Can I tell you what, what John, like one of the best friends of Jesus, he hung around with him. He was the longest of the disciples to live. He got to see all this stuff happen, and he wrote this stuff down, and he communicates this story. Can I tell you what John said about Jesus? You see, I think that that can actually give more weight than giving credence to the whole compilation of Scripture. Now, here's the deal, guys. As I see it, um, as I see it, our job is to point people to Jesus. This is how, in my mind, I see this whole process happening. I see this big dartboard, and I see, I see Jesus at the center of the target, and, and there's people that are all over the spectrum as we come about this. Our job is to point people to Jesus and get them to Jesus as soon as they quite possibly can. The problem is, is, as we start to approach people and we start to have conversations with people, we find that there are all these sticking issues outside of Jesus. You know, I'll talk to some people and I'll start talking to them about Jesus and all of a sudden they start talking about dinosaurs. and like, where did dinosaurs come from and why aren't they mentioned in the Bible? And, and so what I do with somebody with dinosaurs is like, that's an outer ring issue. It's like, you know what, can we put dinosaurs aside for a minute and let's get to Jesus and then we can come back and talk about dinosaurs. I love dinosaurs, you know. Let's, let's do that, right? In, in the same way, guys, you're... Don't hear what I'm not saying. Hear what I am saying. In the same way, the Bible for some people has become an issue and a barrier and a stumbling block for people to get to Jesus. It has. And here's the deal. For, uh, for a person who looks at the Bible and goes, that is a barrier for me to get to Jesus, man, I'll have a conversation day in and day out with you about why this can be historically reliable and how you can actually approach it. I'll give a greater degree of context for this because it stands in the way of you and Jesus. But I am not going to put this as a stumbling block for somebody else. What I'll do is I'll say, hey, listen, I know you've got some issues with the Bible. To be honest with you, I've got some issues with how it was compiled as well. Is it possible for us to set this aside for a moment? Can we set that aside for a minute and just talk about the actual reason why that thing was put together in the first place? Can we talk about the person of Jesus? And I, can I tell you my story of how I understand who he is? Can I tell you the story of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, these historical people who really lived, who really wrote these documents that are reliable and were considered sacred and inspired even in that point in time? Can I talk to you about that? And then we'll come back to look at the Bible so it can confirm the faith that you come to in Jesus. And it can offer some direction 
to how you live. Guys, I, I think that the Bible was always intended to confirm rather than convince people about Jesus. And I think that should change the way in which we approach it and, and the ways in which we use it with other people. Now, guys, this has just been a, an opening conversation about the Bible today. Next week, I hope you guys come back. We're going to be looking at week three of this particular series. We're going to be taking a look at a new agreement. Next week, we're actually going to dive into uh, deeper, like how we should actually approach the two covenants that we see, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the Old Testament and the New Testament, because the way in which we approach those men, they drastically change the way in which we live our lives and the way in which we talk to other people about it. Because here's the problem. When you bind it all together and you call it the Christian Bible, you unknowingly give equal authority to the whole thing. Now, this whole thing is equally inspired, but it's not equally applicable. And that's exactly what Paul is trying to communicate to us in Galatians. And so in Galatians chapter 3 next week, I want you guys to read ahead because it's going to be incredibly important. But read Galatians 3 next week. What you're going to see is you're going to see Paul talking about this, this old covenant, you're going, to be, you're going to see him kind of line up Abraham. And he says, you know what? Abraham was given a promise that actually preceded the law by 430 years. Before the law was even given, this, this covenant that we live under Moses, before it was even given, it was, Abraham was given a promise. And that promise precedes and supersedes the law in the first place. And then he comes together and he says this. He says, guys, and Jesus fulfilled the law. And he also fulfilled the promise. And because of that, something completely new happened. A new agreement happened. And it should change the way in which you live your life. It should change the way in which you approach the scriptures. It should change the way in which you approach other people about this topic. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this conversation today. And this is a lot, Father. It is a mouthful. It is, it is hard for us to wrap our, our brains around. Um, and because sometimes we don't know exactly uh, how we should actually approach the Bible. Father, I pray that each and every one of us, you'd give us a, a passion and a love for your word that is communicated to us in these scriptures and these documents that were compiled and put together so long ago. But I also pray that you give us a right understanding so that we can use it rightly, that you give us a right approach so we can help other people understand it. Father, we, we wouldn't allow this incredible book that we have to actually become a hindrance for us to get people to your son, Jesus. Instead, we'd be able to use it to confirm who Jesus is in the first place. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, guys. Um, my name is Josiah Weiss. I'm a pastor here. And like Corey said, uh, we want Jesus to be the center of everything we do here. Um, we want, want him to be the center of every moment that we have uh, here at Trace Church, and we just had a pretty big, in-depth conversation, and there's really two posture or three postures we can have, and over here, we can have the posture where we have, you know, closed fists, and we're holding on to everything, and, you know, we don't want to let go of how we use the Bible or what we think of the Bible, um, or we're on the other side, and we're like, just throw it out if we don't need it, you know, we got to uh, just talk about Jesus, and, and we're trying to find somewhere in the middle, uh, somewhere where we have our hands open, and we're in a humble a position where we're able to respond uh, to what what Corey said and what uh, God is teaching us through this book called Galatians. And so right now we're going to enter into a time of response to do just that, uh, to go before God, whether it's in your seat uh, and you just need to have a conversation with him and you need to say, God, here are some of my stumbling blocks. Here are the things I'm dealing with. Uh, God, please help me to get through these. Help, help me to, to find my way through this. Um, another way you can respond is by going uh, to the tables around the room with the crosses. Uh, there you can take communion, and all communion is is where we, like we said, we want to make Jesus the center. And so we're going to put him at the center of our thoughts, and we're going to remember what he did for us on the cross by taking uh, the cracker and taking the juice and remembering what he's done for us. And then also at these tables, you can bring uh, your gifts and your offerings over to these tables and uh, be able to give generously because God has given generously to us. So we're going to enter into a time of response as the band comes in pl plays. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. God, thank you for all the different lessons you've taught us. God, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the power that's in it. But more importantly, God, thank you for Jesus. God, I pray that we would be able... Uh, God, to just make him the center of our lives in this moment, in this time of response, um, in the different things that we're doing, God. Um, I pray that we would continue to point others to you, and God, that we wouldn't make uh, your word a stumbling block to them. Uh, God, we love you so much. We're so grateful for Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.